Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Monday morning. We appreciate your attendance. My name is Daniel Fanning. I'm the Vice President of Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber, our Chamber Foundation, and our partners at the Duluth News Tribune, we're just really excited to welcome you back uh, to the forums, the Canada forums for this year, 2024. We've got two today and three tomorrow. So as you'll hear me say this, if you stick around, uh, we're just going to go through a couple basic ground rules. But before I do, I just want to introduce our Chamber staff. We've got our President, Matt Baumgartner, with us. As you'll see Leah in the back taking pictures and video that she'll post on our Facebook and our social media and our website at DuluthChamber.com. Uh, so Leah, thank you for promoting this. Kathleen Prevett is the one who works with the garden to set this all up. So thank you to her and the garden for hosting us. Uh, so it's been a good team effort and we're just really grateful that you're here. So I know as you walked in, you received the civility rules. So this is a good partnership with the civility project. We appreciate the work that the Duluth Superior Community Area Foundation does with us as well. I know you all know this, but just to state the obvious, we ask that you please keep your applause and your, your jeering or your cheering to yourself, unless it's, unless it's directed at the moderators. In that case, we can handle it. Oh, no. <laughs> But we really do. This is meant to be a very uh, low-key informational. This is not meant to be a contentious debate. This is really meant for candidates to have an opportunity to, to share with you their visions, their values. There should be no gotcha questions. There really should be no surprise questions. No candidates receive the questions in advance. I can assure you of that because if anyone accuses us otherwise, they, they obviously don't know Chuck and I that well because we don't always have the final questions in front of us either. We're kinda, we've got a basic framework with the questions we want to ask candidates, but we also will ad-lib based on what's been brought up and what hasn't been brought up. So we appreciate more than anything the candidates being here and making time in your busy schedules. So again, on behalf of the Chamber, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Chuck, who happens to be celebrating a birthday today. So happy birthday, Chuck. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank you, everybody. And, and yes, welcome to uh, Commissioner Grimm, uh, Councillor Kennedy. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to everyone who showed out this morning. I know these early morning uh, forums aren't always the best attended, and I really appreciate everyone being here. And uh, eventually, th this, we are recording this, and it'll be posted at DuluthNewsTribune.com. These forums, for the News Tribune's purposes, also help to inform our endorsement editorials. Endorsements aren't meant to tell anyone who to vote for, but to kind of get people thinking and to try to uh, use informed opinion to uh, lead a conversation. And because and, and, the most important decision is the decisions made by voters on November 5th, of course. Uh, uh, candidates especially, I want to introduce you to, to Kathy Burnt in the front here, who will be holding up uh, time, uh, how much time you have left on your answers. Uh, as uh, you've been informed, we'll have one minute opening statements, one and a half minute uh, closing remarks. Uh, your answers will be timed and limited to a minute, but we will offer rebuttals. Uh, if there's more you want to add, we can certainly do that. Uh, the rebuttals will be at the discretion and direction of Dan and myself. Uh, so with, with that said, we will get uh, right to it. Uh, we'll begin with those opening remarks, a chance for the candidates to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, why you're running or why you're running again, and uh, what uh, maybe your focus might be. Uh, I flipped a coin. Uh, you, you weren't there for it, but I swear I did. And uh, 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 Commissioner Grimm, you'll, 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 get, you'll get to go first. All right. Well, thank you. I am Ashley Grimm, your third district county commissioner. Uh, I live in the Denfeld neighborhood with my husband, Luke, and my three-month-old baby boy. And before the county, I ran children and family programming at the Damiano Center. Uh, it is because of my passion for youth and families that I'm especially proud of getting historic county investment into our western neighborhoods. Um, that includes $250,000 for Gary New Duluth Rec and renovating the Young Moms Spirit Valley program. Um, I'm also excited to share more about the countywide work that we've done, including ending, um, ending chronic veteran homelessness in St. Louis County. Um, it is because of hard work and good relationships over these last four years that that has been possible. And I'm proud to be endorsed by um, on my fellow Duluth commissioners, Annie Harla and Patrick Boiler, <laughs> Patrick Boyle, uh, and uh, some of our statewide legislators, including our Western rep, uh, Liz Olson. So I'm excited to the, uh, to the forum today. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Kennedy. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Janet Kennedy. I'm currently serving as the past president of Duluth City Council and have been honored to be able to serve the community for the past five years. I am running for uh, County Commissioner District 3. So what I've been watching and what I've been seeing on the City Council is that we've been asked more and more to do public health and human services. And the city is not the place that we can do that. The funding at the, at the county is 11% uh, larger 
that budget for public health and human services is 11% larger than our whole uh, city budget. So when we say historic investment, we need to realize that for the last four years it's been COVID. There's been historic money put into a lot of things. But in the next four years, we're not going to have that funding. You know, the work that I do in building nonprofits, founding nonprofits, business work, and serving as a city council and understanding budgets is imperative, and that's what we need to continue to move forward for the next four years. All right, thank you both for the opening statements. We've got nine formal questions. Like Chuck mentioned, we, we're going to ask you each to keep, try to keep it to a minute. We've got some flexibilities for rebuttals or follow-ups, uh, but we'll just jump right into question number one. I know some of you already addressed this in your opening remarks, but I mean, bigger picture, the county board is one that sometimes flies a little bit under the radar compared to other uh, local governments. If elected or re-elected, could you tell us what your priorities would be and how you hope to make a difference in your constituents' lives? And for this one, we will start with Janet. Um, thank you again. So for the past 10 years, I've spent a lot of work assessing local needs, whether it be through the nonprofit or whether it be through the city. Understanding regional and state policies, priorities, and outcomes is what we need to do. Our geography in St. Louis County is diverse, and we, need to, we know that we make better decisions when everyone's at the table and has an opportunity to be in the picture. So one of the first priorities is making sure we have a consensus on the county board that health and human services or health and social determinants of health are the most important things on how we move forward to make sure everybody has a chance at uh, well-being and um, life expectancies. So um, the work that we need to do together will happen when we make sure that we have leadership who can build that consensus. On the city council, I've been able to do that. I also have endorsements where the, um, through the Deputy Sheriff's Association, AFL-CIO, NELC, elected leaders and community members across the board. This year we get to have a choice, and I believe I'm the right choice. Thank you. Ashley? Yeah, thank you. I think um, I want to continue the work that we're doing on housing and child care for start. Uh, we know that we are in a housing crisis. And over the last four years, we, I have helped bridge north-south divides and taken projects that started out as a no and turned them into unanimous yes votes. That's the kind of culture that we have on the county board right now. That's why we were able to invest in 24 units at Plover Place, partner with the city on many of these projects and get that money into Duluth. Um, what I would like to see and that I've started is also fundamentally shifting how we look at housing and child care. We need to change how we build and I've brought together a working group to manufacture our own housing and work with Boulder, Colorado and, Boulder, Colorado and other areas that are producing their own units so we do more than just a drop in the bucket. I'm also working on the county's first ongoing child care funding stream with Commissioner Keith Musolf so that we can continue to partner with Northland Foundation and make a dent because we see right now without that, child care centers are closing. So those are just a few. Thank you. Moving on. Our next question happens to be about housing specifically. As you both know, from Duluth to the Iron Range and, and pretty much all over the country, housing supplies are inadequate at all income levels. We hear a lot about what the state has been doing and, and what individual cities do to change that or trying to do. What should the county's role be and what more can the county do? Is it those partnerships uh, with cities that you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Grimm, or, or is there more? And we'll start with you, Commissioner Grimm. Yes, I think, I think that's why it's important that I'm coming in with great relationships with our Duluth legislative body. So we've had conversations that are ongoing about ways that the, that the state can come in and help either uh, with housing supports or direct investments. Uh, Representative Leesh Kozlowski and I have specifically talked about the manufacturing plant and the fact that there's a lot of state money out there for modular building. Uh, also, we act as a convener, right? Uh, one of the first people that organizations I reached out to is RAMS. They do a lot of organizing on the Iron Range so we can convene the, the city and the county and the state all together. And that's part of why I've been a consistent leader on our intergovernmental team, bringing together our city councilors, our county commissioners, and our school board members. And for instance, with the housing uh, unsheltered people that we have in Duluth right now, uh, Commissioner Harla and I brought together the city and the county, so we're actually making a game plan for people to go instead of pushing people from one block to the next or kicking the can to each other like this is important we work together 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kennedy. Uh, thank you. Yes, housing is so, so important. Um, I've been on the city council and I was one of the authors for the Affordable Housing Coalition. We've given more and more money, especially when we recognize that our unhoused community members are suffering. So what happened during the unhoused encampments, um, my district and commissioner, our councillor, District 4, were the ones who really had um, a lot of people unhoused. We called the county and said, these are on properties that the county have, the forfeited lands, and we got nothing. So we pushed and pushed and got, we pulled together, the city councilors pulled together, county commissioners, we wanted to do a walkthrough. And what happened by then, the city and the county worked intergovernmentally. We were pushing, the city pushed. And what shouldn't happen is that the city has to push the county to do the work that they already have money to do. That's the important difference. And right now, we have people that we've been able to push again because we have to make laws at the city level. I'm excited to go and build the programs and the policies and all of the work that we need to do. We should not be making laws for housing. We need to be making housing on the front end. As a way of following up, uh, Commissioner Grimm, you mentioned uh, partnerships, uh, relationships with legislators, partnerships with cities, but that can only go so far, can it? What, what, what can the county be doing specifically, and maybe on its own? Yeah. Uh, so the, first, I just want to say I'm a, I'm a little disappointed in some of the misunderstandings of, of what the county has been doing. The county has been at the table and has been convening these meetings, and I know because I'm one of the only elected officials who has consistently been there every month with the Stepping On Up program. Like, I am that contact person. Um, I have the person, have been the person who's sending out the invites for our intergovernmental meetings, and myself, Lynn Nephew, um, and counselors, uh, Roz and Mayo and myself and Annie Harla are on that ongoing working group. So I just want to be clear and really honor that work. Um, what, you're right that it's more than just leveraging money. We have to make direct investments and we also have to make sure we're staffing these. So public health and human services, part of why we're at the table is so that we can help create community crisis response and we can have those street outreach workers at, uh, at a sanctioned campsite for people. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we help, uh, we manage coordinated entry lists, right? And so when we do direct investments into Steve O'Neill apartments and into the 3,000 other um, places that we've helped with tax abatements to and partnered with the city, that makes a huge difference. Sure. Uh, Councilor Kennedy, you mentioned too funding and, and giving money, but clearly throwing money at the problem isn't getting it solved. Uh, what, what have you learned from your time on the council that will translate to the county board on this issue? And if you go a little over a minute, that's okay. So. Um, thank you again. So it is important that and to know that yes, the, uh, the money that comes in is not the only thing. Um, we can't make laws to solve the problem. We can't just throw money at it. So the investments that we we make need to make sure that we understand the problem at the core. And what that means is having boots on the ground, and that's one of the things that I know that I have been having for the last few years. Building a nonprofit and understanding and working with the intergovernmentally, but also understanding intragovernmentally is really important. Working within that system of the county or the city and understand the outcomes. But with outcomes means that we are impacting people's lives and the programs policies and procedures need to make sure we have everyone at the table. It can't be a win or lose at all. And what I've heard from the, on the county board is sometimes it's a win or lose. We don't have that funding for COVID anymore. We need to be really, really strategic. Make sure we're working together for all of the policies that we need know that are gonna impact our people. Whether it be housing, whether it be economic development, whether it be children and families, I know that work, I live that work, I'm gonna do the best job I can. I do need to learn more about the county, but I learned everything from the city and can bring that over, which is transferable, intergovernmental, and intragovernmental. Thank you both very much, Dan. 
That's a great segue to our next question, question three, which is about economic development, an issue that's near and dear to the hearts of us at the chamber, as well as our partners at Apex. As you mentioned, the, the county is involved with economic development. Just from your perspective, obviously this is an issue that's often seen more as a city or state issue, but the county is involved. What more could the county even be doing to encourage even more economic development, industry, commercial activity, creation of good paying jobs throughout northeastern Minnesota? And we will begin with Councilor Kennedy. Um, thank you. So economic development to me means, again, when you look through the lens of the social determinants of health, it's everything. Everything that you, impacts your life, whether you're from um, birth to death. So economic development means employment and daycare, living wage jobs, which are really important, opportunities for everyone, especially when, you want, when we look at collective bargaining. Economic development means also housing stability, food security, public safety, and public infrastructure. So we need all of those to make sure everybody's doing well so that you can go and do your job. So one of the things I want to make sure is when we're going to the state, we have the voices that understand that from the ground up. Not just the one voice as far as whether you're endorsed by a, a, a DFL or endorsed by labor or not, um, I think the people that I represent and that look like me need to have a voice at the table. It's no longer good enough for us to just have one segment of our community going and making the decisions. We won't do anybody justice if we continue on this path. We all here know that we make better decisions when everyone's at the table. And this is the time that we do it right now. We don't have another four years. People's lives are at stake. Thank you. Commissioner? This is very important. It's something I have a strong track record on. Uh, first, we need to be scrappy with every pot of money that comes our way. So for example, uh, when the first round of COVID relief came, there was a big push to not use any on this, um, in Duluth. And I worked to make sure with staff that we pushed hard for Western Duluth, and we supported over 100 businesses that got grants. Um, I was the only commissioner to hold um, a public town hall, bring staff and walk uh, business owners through it. Uh, we also, I supported direct investments like in Helene, which is one of the biggest solar companies in the, uh, in the world, and abatements to SD Paper and Sofidel, um, and supported the film incentive that has um, brought incredible business to the area. But importantly, we have to expand what we think of as economic development. I have been a leading voice saying childcare is economic development, and these are models that work, and this is how we can fund it. Um, I got $750,000 that I fought tooth and nail for um, and in developing that $100,000 funding stream. There's so much more to say than a minute can allow. <laughs> I'd be remiss if we didn't follow up on this. It's such a big topic for us, of course, and for the community, especially in, in this district. You mentioned Sofidel, Amazon Distribution Center. There's a lot of economic development opportunities already right now. Just off the cuff, I mean, are there other ones that you're aware of and or do you support a couple of those economic development activities, such as the expansion of Sofidel and as well as the Amazon Distribution Center? Councilor Kennedy, I know you've both worked on these issues. Would you mind just talking about that for just another minute? Uh, certainly. All of the projects that um, Commissioner Grimm has brought up are intergovernmental projects. So the city's been in as well. And so with that, I've been doing the same work that she's been doing. There's no upper hand on her giving more money than what we've been giving in the city. And when I say we, it's not just me doing it. It's me doing it with all of you, the, cha the, comp the Chamber of Commerce, community members, organizations. So if we look at the project, so at, uh, the skateboard project, you will hear uh, Commissioner Grimm say she got that across the, the finish line. Here's the thing, the finish line started way back when the community members were involved. The city invested even more money in that. I don't say that that's me doing that. That's nine people that voted. We all did a consensus on that. One of the biggest projects that we've been working on, and I know Commissioner Grimm will, has been a part of that, a small part of it, because money is important and we have to get there, but the part of the process that we need to make sure we continue to work on is making it happen. The Spirit Valley Center for Youth and Community Wellness Project had a daycare component of it. Commissioner Grimm was 
that person that was leading that. We no longer have that line for the daycare, but we do, and we have been building a working group that's working on that project. That will be a project that'll be circular and, and serving our community from elders all the way to children. Thank right you. now, we are looking at a path where we're gonna build a community school model for health. That's economic development, and that's health. Thank you, Councillor. Commissioner, you have one minute response as well? Yeah, I think a, a dynamic to remember is that on the county board, we have three seats in Duluth and four seats out of Duluth. And so historically, there's been areas that we haven't touched. And that's why I'm really proud that I've been able to build consens consensus and, um, and make sure that we're prioritizing Duluth projects. I mean, that's no small feat. And these have been unanimous yes votes. And we've invested in youth rec, like for that Spirit Valley project. That started as a no. We don't, we don't invest in youth rec and West Duluth. Uh, and I got to get $15,000 for planning funds because it's important we have tangible results for people. Um, but the same thing, I've really supported those projects that you mentioned. I also support uh, workers who are trying to unionize those spaces, right? We want Amazon to be a, we a well-paying um, workplace for people. Uh, and, uh, and the manufacturing plant that I mentioned, I think is going to be really key too because it not only affects affordable housing, but it builds workforce. And we've got Minnesota housing that's interested, nonprofits, and we can actually think of, of create businesses and train our workforce and also develop our own housing at the same time. So I think there's innovative ideas like that coming in the future too. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Speaking of inside Duluth, outside Duluth, uh, Western Duluth, District, District 3, of course, is just a small part of an enormous county, as you both know. Uh, how can voters be assured or how can you assure voters that you're willing and able to work with communities countywide to meet the needs of residents both in the north and the south? A little bit bigger picture question this time. Uh, Commissioner Grimm, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I'm really glad you asked that question. So uh, countywide, the way that I was able to help pass some of this money for West Duluth is it was part of one million for kids. That's what I pushed for. And that one million for kids, I worked with Paul McDonald to bridge that divide. And for, for instance, it started a Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing as well. I mean, it supported projects countywide. That $750,000 for childcare was built that it could do training and investment throughout all of St. Louis County. Um, when I heard from a veteran's family that they couldn't access benefits when their um, husband had died from his term in service, I worked with the county board and then disabled American veterans in Minnesota to make statewide changes in access to veterans' benefits that helped keep veterans in their home. These things are built by collaboration, and it doesn't get touched on a lot, and I think there's a lot of assumptions, which is really why I want to highlight these last three and a half years have been different than what they've been before and it actually leaves me inspired and is why I'm running again because more is possible than I even thought. Thank you. Former Council President Kennedy. Um, thank you. Can you repeat the question? I'm, we're asking a little bit about how voters can be assured that you're willing to work countywide to meet the needs of residents both in the north and the south. Um, for me, I would look at um, the record that I've had and um, the work that I've been able to do on the city council. Um, I have been able to bridge a gap with uh, county commissioners who people say are difficult. And that's really a testament to how I work. It doesn't matter to me who you are, if you're DFL and if you're not DFL. We need to work together. So one of the things we want to make sure we're doing is building that consensus. Um, my endorsements are not uh, Republican or Democrat. My endorsements are with people who work across the spectrum, AFL, CIO, elected leaders, community leaders, people who are sitting uh, at the table today who have children. Um, my family are, is a veteran family. I know what it's like. We've served in Korea, we've served in Vietnam, we've served in Afghanistan. I also have the Duluth Sheriff's Association, and it's really hard because for me as a woman, a woman of color, I'm overrepresented in two of the largest institutions in the county, public health and human services and the criminal justice and court systems. We need to make sure we have the voices that understand. I've been in jail when my boyfriend was my abuser and I threw a shoe at him. I understand the whole process comprehensively. I know I can step into a place because I'm not stepping in without judgments. I don't have to fight within men and women. 
I can have a conversation about where I've been, where I've lived, my lived experience, and people will listen. There's no preconceived notions. I'm not there for power. I'm not there to fight. I'm there to make a difference, and people know that. Thank you very much. I just want to remind both the candidates that the timekeeper is holding up the signs. As a way to just follow up or dig a little deeper on, on, on that question, obviously you're representing the entire county, but I would assume your focus or your priority would be your district in Western Duluth. Uh, uh, Commissioner Grimm, would you say that that's true and, and in what way? Yeah, I would say both. I, I deeply feel the obligation to support every person in St. Louis County. Um, a kid is a kid is a kid in anywhere that you grow up. Um, what I want to make sure is that Western Duluth has our fair share, that we're building the connections that it takes to make sure that we're not just investing in greater St. Louis County because they have four out of seven votes. And that's something I'm incredibly proud of because we work together, because I'm able to work with Commissioner McDonald and Musolf and Patrick Boyle and Commissioner Harla. So I think I think there's a mix, but uh, constituents expect and deserve to have someone who really pushes for our districts, who feels it, who feels when our child care centers close, right? Um, but who is also willing to make um, big changes that are countywide and invest that time. Um, like one of the largest things that I worked on as chair of public safety was getting um, the scandalous for-profit health care out of our jails and getting a local provider in there because that supports everyone in St. Louis County and it's the right thing to do. Uh, Councilor Kennedy, to wrap, to wrap up this, this topic, can you comment just a little bit more on the, the balancing, how you balance the needs of the District District 3 in Western Duluth versus countywide needs? Well, I had talked earlier about looking at the intra-governmental work that needs to happen, on whether it's you know, the procedures or the practices. Um, but. Could you repeat that again? Sorry. I'm asking you to talk a little bit about how you balance the needs of District 3 versus the, the needs of the, the county as a whole. Um, and, and expounding on that is understanding that um, I have served the district. I have served District 5. People know that I have their backs. People understand that the work and the, the outcomes that I have are really, really important. Commissioner Grimm has done some, some good work but it's really not good enough. It's easy to do work when you have four years of COVID. COVID is done now. We don't have the same money that we have. We have more mental health and drug addiction. The community and I was able to step in. We need to support the response and actions. We need to make sure it's across the board. I understand that the county is big and I've been there. I've talked to folks. I've talked to the commissioners. They're looking forward to another voice coming to the county. We can't continue to do the same thing and expect the better outcomes. Thank you very much. Throwing it back to you, Dan. All right, just a quick time check. We're about half, we're a little bit more than halfway through our questions and a little bit more than halfway through our time. So we're right on time, so thank you for that. Uh, we're going to shift gears. We've already talked about economic development and housing. Those were two of the top issues that we heard from our, our members last year when we did a survey, the, the Chamber Foundation did a survey. By far the top issue was public safety. So that's going to be the next topic of conversation. Public safety is about 14.5% of the county budget, roughly around $69 million. In your perspective, if you go back to the county board or start with the county board, uh, what do you see as opportunity shortfalls as well as uh, challenges in public safety, not only in West Duluth and Duluth, but also throughout the entire county? We'll start with uh, Councillor Kennedy. Thank you. Um, public safety is really, really important. That's part of economic development. And as I've stated before, it really is telling that the St. Louis County Deputy Sheriff's Association endorsed me. I haven't been there for four years. And so they understand that I'm gonna work with them. Do we need to make, we need to make, also make sure that on the other end, we have programs where our kids and our families aren't getting into the court system. But while we have the jails and we have the things in place, we need to do better. We need to support our sheriffs. We need to support the facilities and make sure they're the best place that we can have so people that are getting out can have a full and have a life that they can thrive with. For me, I want to work on the front end, the systemic issues that are bringing people into that system. But like I said, while we have the system, we need to support the people that work there. They need to be healthy and they need to be well so they can treat the people that are there that are well. 
Um, and it's more about, for me, the systemic issue of is it something that we need to do today? It's something that we have and we need to do it very, very well so that people that are going into the system know that they are treated well and that people care about them because they will come out someday. Thank you. Commissioner? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so we each have track records and this is mine. This is what I've delivered. Um, I've delivered competitive and fair wages for our staff in public safety. Um, I went to bat for early retirement age for 911 dispatchers at the state. I think that's huge. It's actually affecting their life expectancy, the work that they do. Um, I've toured, I've been present, um, and importantly, I've helped increase mental health resources with the rest of the county board. So public safety is also mental health, and we see that affecting our community deeply. Um, just last month, we opened up an urgent care for mental health so people can come and the police, the sheriff's department, our community crisis response team can bring people in for immediate care and that care even includes dental. Um, I was at the working table to, to create 24-7 community crisis response because we heard that even when there was suicide attempts with the Duluth Police Department uh, and they called crisis response, they had to wait nine hours. So I work to make sure that now there is um, a consistent community crisis response team and mental health there. These are the kinds of big changes that I've helped make and will continue to make, and it's why our track records matter. Thank you. Very good. Back to you, Chuck. Thanks, Dan. 30, well, I won't say exactly how many, 30-some years ago when I first started the News Tribune, I covered the county board, and I remember commissioners complaining about unfunded mandates. We still hear commissioners complaining about unfunded mandates. I'm hoping each of you can cite maybe an example of a particularly egregious unfunded mandate and the problems it's causing, and also how can elected commissioners better work with our lawmakers to ease this burden? Uh, Commissioner Grimm, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, the county is the administrative arm of the state, so about 80% of what we would do, I say, is actually state mandated. Um, and I wanna highlight our Duluth contingent of legislators has been incredibly responsive. This is one of the first sessions where we've actually got a significant increase in local government aid. And that's because we've been able to relay that some of these things aren't working. Um, but you're right, we, we are boots on the ground no matter what, we have to make it happen. Um, so something important that happened is there was um, um, no longer uh, automatic renewals after COVID for MA benefits. A wide amount, thousands of people were potentially going to be kicked off of their MA benefits, and we know what that would mean to community members. So we didn't get extra staffing for that. We made it work. Um, I would challenge one thing that was said earlier. There was nothing easy about getting through COVID. There was nothing easy about um, having, having, keeping people on their MA benefits, but we made sure to up our staffing to do the planning that it would take to make sure that people had their continuous care and weren't taken off their mental health meds or physical meds. Thank you. Councillor Kennedy, the question is about unfunded mandates. Um, thank you for that question. I just wanted to make sure we understand that there's local government aid that comes to the city and there's county government aid. So there's two differences. The county government aid is what is mandated more than the local government aid that comes to the city. Um, so there are, I don't have any specifics because I have not had a chance to look into the budget. I will just say that my mom right now is on hospice with dementia care and I've been dealing with that. That is one other thing that the county is funding. I will tell you the process that I went through to get her there was not easy. So we need to make sure we're funding the workforce, whether it be for our mental health, whether it be for our children, our, our public health, um, or and our seniors. That process was one of the hardest things ever when you watched your family member change. And you get a phone call and they said they'll call you back and you wait two weeks. Right now the county had to go out and have a, a third party help them with that work. We need to make sure we're funding that. That was during COVID in four years. I'm not sure why that was happening when we have commissioners saying they have direct access to the state. We need to make sure we're funding everyone from childbirth to death. You're impacted by the county and we need to make sure we're doing all that work comprehensively. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up, uh, Commissioner Grimm. You both have mentioned, actually, your relationships and working with legislators. On unfunded mandates specifically, what more can the county do to kind of get the state to be a better partner with providing the funds for the mandates it's, it's ordering? 
Commissioner Grimm? Uh, I think one of the things that has helped uh, get past a lot of the things I've gotten past is community organizing. So I think it's really important, like the, stories, the story that you shared and when people are able to share their life experiences. And that's why I've worked with, um, for example, uh, thousands of people that I marched with for mental health because we need better mental health access. I would love to see, and I've been talking to child care providers about um, creating a network where we can come up to the Capitol and I know the Chamber has been a huge partner in this too, to bring um, people who are child care providers who are struggling too, so they're talking directly with representatives. I think that that voice is really important. Um, and it's also important, uh, that's one of the important things about having someone who's been in there for three and a half years working specifically on county issues. We need to have ideas about the county. We need those relationships coming in on county issues. Um, I've also worked worked uh, statewide with uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties uh, and actually was elected to be one of their national delegates. So we right now have someone on the national level who is bringing forward St. Louis County issues and that really matters in this next term. Thank you. Councilor Kennedy, have a, a final word on partnering with the state more effectively? Uh, thank you for that. Um, partnering with the state um, is really important. What I know, uh, working in the nonprofit, I bring in $450,000 a year on the ground in a small nonprofit. That's all at the state level. That's direct work at the state level. Telling stories, getting money to serve our community. I don't, I don't need a, a staff. I don't need 10 commissioners or, or seven commissioners to do that. I've already been doing that work. So I have the skill to come there and organize. Community organizing is at the core of how we do our work. And we need to bring all of the voices to the state. Right now, I am serving a community, whether it's unhoused, people of color, BIPOC people, LGBTQ community members, community members who are in the majority understand that I know how to do that work. I didn't have to be elected to do it, but I'm choosing to be elected at the county, taking my skills from the city to make sure that we can make a difference. We need to make sure the state hears all of our voices, not through somebody, but directly from somebody. And if we don't get that right now, a lot of people are gonna be hurt. This is a time to make that change now. Thank you both. Question seven is on mining, in particular, copper nickel mining. As you all know, mining is a big part of the economy in Northeast Minnesota and St. Louis County. Copper nickel mining continues to be debated, has been for many, many years. Could you please share us your thoughts on copper nickel mining and mining as a whole? Are you confident that we can move forward, particularly given our green transition and the way we want to move forward in an environmentally safe and responsible way, but also recognizing what an ec economic impact this could be? Uh, Councilor Kennedy, we'll begin with you. Um, thank you. There are many communities in the county that rely on mining. What we can't do is we can't leave people behind. Now, we do need to make sure we're moving to a better economy because we do know that there's some climate change and we need to make sure and support that we're honoring our indigenous people. But here's what we cannot do. We cannot make that change until we prove it first that we're not going to leave communities behind. I'm standing strong on that, and it can be done, but we need to make sure we're working together. If we leave communities behind, our whole county is gonna be hurt. We are here in Duluth, and it's not directly impacting us. And we know that it's easy for us to say that, shame on you, mining's gonna hurt us. But hear me, we are gonna hurt communities if we stand on the stance that it can't be done well. We can't just pivot and change. We need to have a plan. I need everybody to prove it first that we will not hurt communities and leave people behind. That is what I'm not willing to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, like, like many in our community, and actually the courts, I have deep concerns about copper nickel mining and the fact that it's never been done safely in a water-rich environment. Um, so I also support Prove It First. Uh, I also want to be clear that um, I have been fully supportive of taconite mining, and we've done land exchanges, we hire mine inspectors, uh, we partner very fully, and there has, in my term, never been a divided vote on mining. 
And part of why it seems like a disservice to voters sometimes when people running, run on being good for economic development because they support PolyMet is it makes people think, vote, it makes voters think that we have a say over it. Um, and we do economic development. We put in work, we, put ta we take votes. Uh, copper nickel mining actually isn't something that we take a vote on. So I think people deserve a clear answer. I have many safety concerns about the quality of our water and that uh, proposal has not uh, been found to be scientifically viable. Um, and I've been fully supportive of responsible mining and that's actually an area where we've had unanimous support on the county board and we put a lot of uh, time and, and investment into. Great, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Kennedy, in February you said uh, people are being put in danger, end quote, uh, due to inadequate funding for the county jail. I'm curious, what, what did you mean by that specifically, and, and, and how are people being put in danger, and what needs to be done to address that? Um, as I had stated, I have the endorsement of the Deputy Sheriff's Association, and they have let me know, and I have toured the jails, and I have talked to the folks who who are doing the cooking and to the folks who are really caring for our people who are incarcerated. We have jails right now that are inadequate in size and inadequate in staffing. We can no longer maintain that. Do I like the criminal justice system and that people are in it? No, but that's a social issue. And right now, as long as we have jails and as long as we have people working there, we need to make sure the people working there are safe. We need to make sure we have adequate room, that we have adequate programming. There are some dynamic things coming out of um, even the deputy sheriffs that they want to do. They just don't have the room to do it and they don't have the funding to do it. This is a part of our community that we need to make sure we're supporting. I know Commissioner Grimm worked to make sure we have good health care there. But that's one piece of the pie. We need to make sure we're working comprehensively to make sure it all works, that our workers are safe and that the people who are incarcerated are safe and that we really cut the pipeline to that system, starting with our youth and families. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Grimm, do you agree that inadequate funding is, is for the county jail is putting people in danger? I mean, where, where are the opportunities for improvement for the county jail? I really appreciate that you asked that question because it was a blatantly false statement that I cut funding for the county jail. Some of our biggest improvements and um, increases in investment have actually been in public safety, including the mental health care that I fought for in the county jail. I was the person having to make that argument that when we have a local provider that's not putting people off of their meds, that um, transitions people when they get out of incarceration to be directly on their caseload so that there's continuum of care, I was the person pushing and saying that is an important investment. So I'm really glad that you asked that. I also, after that ran, um, I asked the sheriff, I said, am I, am I missing something? I've supported every um, request that has come our way and gone above and beyond. And um, he said, no, not at all. And we're developing a space plan and a plan for what we need in the future for the county jail. Because I do really agree, um, we need to have different facilities for the county jail. And we also need to continue diversion. That's why I've also talked with Carleton County about their diversion project that they have um, for juvenile offender and why I've been very supportive of specialty courts. Councilor Kennedy, I assume you don't agree that that was a false statement. I'm curious, what prompted you to, to, to bring up the issue? Um, I never stated that Commissioner Grimm cut funding. I'm not sure where that came from. What prompted the issue is really looking on the ground at our communities, and then on the other side that the deputies and sheriffs have stated that they need help. So we need to make sure that pipeline to workforce is even stronger than the pipeline to prison with our communities. Being on the ground and having community members that look like me in that system, which is one of the largest systems, we need to make sure we have the right voices at the table to make sure we have the right solutions. Building a bigger facility is only one piece of it. And that's the piece that's important now. Making sure we're cutting that pipeline to prison is even more important. And I know the Deputy Sheriff's Association that endorsed me will agree that we have that goal in common. Until then, we need to do better. And again, I will say, I never stated that Commissioner Grimm cut any funding. Uh, Commissioner Grimm, uh, last uh, minute on the county jail. 
Yeah, I think one of the benefits that voters have right now is that we have a track record on what we've done, both of us. And so what my track record has shown is that I have uh, helped increase the staffing rates in our county jails, I have supported workers, and I've made big structural changes. Uh, that was, when I came on board as chair of public safety, uh, I was a pretty lone voice on getting rid of men to correctional care. Um, they were getting sued left and right uh, in other counties, and I actually worked with brave former county employees who were willing to come forward and say, what I see in the county jail was not normal from that for-profit provider, and it was putting our county employees at risk to be liable. Um, then I heard it wasn't possible to get a local provider. They had tried it before, no one's interested. We were able to work with St. Luke's and get expand um, medical care to work up to 24 seven care to keep people on their meds. I mean, it's, it's a huge, it, it has been a huge change. So between that staffing, specialty courts, innovative ideas on what we can do next, and showing progress, real progress that we've made, we both have track records. Thanks. And our final official question before closing remarks is going to be on taxes. The county board is currently proposing a over 7% tax increase for 2025. As you can imagine, some of our members feel like this is high. Do you support that? And can you speak to how the county is being a responsible steward of public tax dollars? We're going to flip the order now just so that we can flip the, uh, the closing responses or closing remarks. So we, for this one, we will begin with Commissioner Grimm. Yeah, so. Um some years we've come in higher than the city, some years we've come in lower, this year we're coming in higher. Uh, we're capturing the rate of growth, our rate of growth is a little over 7%, but still um, when the initial number came in it was over 9%. Uh, so I helped with other county commissioners to work with our departments and actually reduce that by two points. About two-thirds, exactly two-thirds actually, of our budget increase is the wage negotiations that we had. The increase in health care costs for our county employees and the increase to um, retain and attract staff because turnover is expensive. And so this is part of why it becomes really important to work with the state to get that other county aid, that local government aid. Um, and it's also why I have been a financial hawk. Every time there's a position that opens up, um, I make sure and other commissioners make sure that that's reevaluated to make sure that we actually need that position. Um, I have not been afraid to vote no on wasteful spending, um, and I've worked deeply with the departments to reduce our levy numbers to make sure we're coming in below the rate of growth. So. Thank you. Councilor Kennedy? Uh, thank you. The, the budgets are really, really important, and I will say, I, I don't say that I have heard or that I've, I've worked alone, but I've done this work. And when I say I have heard is really um, talking about the last question. You know, I have had community, I have had family members who've been in prison, in jail, and in the workforce. I have had people that I know that live in my community that have been impacted by that. The budgets that we bring forward, we need to make sure that everybody is at the table and understanding I have been so impacted by all of the conversations that we have today, personally. I don't have to ask, I don't have to go and do a, uh, a community organizing and getting people at the table because they're right here with me today, every single day. So as we talk about the budgets, the budgets are the same as far as what we're looking at. The city of Duluth is 1.86, I heard the county is about six. That does make a difference in how we're moving forward to uh, all of the programming. I do need to do more work on the budget and understanding that at the county, but I've been really, really, really uh, a leader in the budget for the city and understanding how to lower the cost for community members. So we have that same work that we've done in each of our respective roles. I will just say we need to understand and make sure we're moving forward in the next four years with a leader that has a voice that has not been at the table right now. That's the important thing. That's how we make sure budgets are getting where they get or, or need to go. Okay, with that, we are officially done with the formal question. So again, thank you both for doing this. Uh, you each have a minute and a half for closing remarks, and we are just a little bit over time, so we please respectfully ask that you try to keep it to 90 seconds. And for this one, we will begin with Councillor Kennedy. 
Um, thank you. Uh, it's really good to sit with um, uh, Commissioner Grimm because we have not had this conversation. I've not heard of the all of the work she's doing. And that's why I ran for the county because people aren't understanding that the county impacts them more than the city does. So one of the things that we understand is that county commissioners do a lot of work at the federal level. They do a lot of work on the county operations and make sure they run smoothly. We know that representation on the city council has made a difference because I am the one, myself, uh, former Councilor Vanette, and all of the other people who are not in the majority community have really made a difference. The last four years we have been able to move forward and Commissioner Grimm has been able to move forward because we have had funding from COVID. We don't have that anymore. I've worked in my nonprofit, a small nonprofit, in my business building community development and understand that the county impacts us more. We need to make sure we have all of our voices. We need to make sure that everyone at the table understands the work. That's why I started running for county commissioner. So when I say we need to make a change now, it's because there are people in our community who do not have the same life expectancy as you do. Those are people that look like me. And people understand that I understand that. Even though you may not be an African-American woman, you may be a person of the majority community, people have trusted me. And they know that when I move and I've said that, Janet, we're good with you going from the city to the county because we know you're going to get that work done. I don't have to do the I heard. I don't have to call people up. I know it because I live it. All of those institutions at the county I've been impacted by. I was a single mother and raised my kids on welfare and was able to get off there. My mom, who has Alzheimer's dementia, we need to make sure we're caring for everybody. I am a grandmother of nine. I'm a mother of two. This work needs to be done by all of us. We are all here and understand that we make better policies when everybody's at the table. The time to make a change is now. And I'm asking for your vote for St. Louis County Commissioner District 3. Well, again, thank you both very much. Just a reminder for those who might have walked in, uh, this, this conversation has been recorded. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you have to go too. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Neil. That you was get, the you easiest closing statement I've ever done. That was good. I'm sorry. Really go ahead with your closing statement. Thank you. Thank you. Good catch. The floor is yours for 90 seconds. <laughs> Um, first, I want to thank you for giving time to discuss the county. It really has been the honor of my career to serve in this role. And I want to take uh, this time to actually highlight some things that we didn't get to talk about quite as much. Um, because what we've done and this track record and the specifics that we bring to the job really matter to people. So some of the highlights, and most of these started as no's and ended up in unanimous yeses. Um, we helped fund the Lincoln Park Children's and Family Collaborative to get a new space. And what that means is that they were able to have the down payment so that they have a space where people can have family visitations and actually have the privacy that they deserve. Um, I helped fund a million for kids and it did a lot for Duluth, but it also did a lot for Hibbing and Chester, uh, and Eastern Duluth and Chester Bowl. Um, changing medical providers uh, means that we keep people on their mental health meds. It means that people are less likely to come back into the county jail. Um, helping create the crisis response team and being there at every step of the way uh, means that when a person has a mental health episode in Duluth and throughout St. Louis, Lewis County, they're less likely to go to jail for it. Um, I've also helped increase access to veterans' benefits statewide so that veterans can stay in their homes. And I'm working right now with the school district and the city to make sure that we keep funding Check and Connect because that has meant that we have over 34 mentors working directly with students to keep them graduating on time. I'm not here to tear anybody down. I want to work with Councilor Kennedy on our shared priorities. We both have most of our terms in front of us and I'm excited to work on those together thank you very much now I'll wrap it up sorry about that <laughs>
Just again, on behalf of Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce and our partners at Duluth News Tribune, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, just a reminder that these will be posted on the DNT website as well as the Duluth Chamber website. And uh, again, just more than anything, we are grateful for the candidates for making the time. Thank you all for being here. We've got about a five or six minute break before our next forum, which is the sixth judicial race. And then tomorrow, of course, we've got three state house races as well. So we invite you to stick around for that. But in closing, will you please join me in thanking these two candidates. It takes courage to come up here and run for office, so thank you. Thank you.